Bobby is a true blessing, uh, having got to know her for a number of years now, because she helps so much in the Commonwealth, but she carries so much. And uh, I've got to read her book. It's a beautiful book, and there is so much about the delight of the delight of God to bring us into His freedom and His wholeness and His beauty. So I hope you can come and be a part of the next couple of sessions. But I asked her, you know, could you come and do uh, a Wednesday service for us? And she, and I she says, oh, I just got my ticket and I'm not going to get here till nighttime. And I said, oh, bummer. And then she went and changed her ticket. She flew in today. So I'm going to ask you a big favor. I want every one of us to just kick your faith in and say, I want the gift of Jesus Christ that resides in this woman. And I want this gift to be released into my life right now. And if you'll pull with faith, she won't have to use her adrenaline. <laughs> Does that sound like a good idea? All right, let's welcome Bobby. Come on up. <clears throat> Hi, family. It feels so good to be here. So, so good. I definitely feel like I'm at home. So it's beautiful to see you all. And it's so exciting to actually be here ahead of glory. Um, I just know God's going to do so much. And I just love the fact that we are a kingdom family, that CCF and Jubilee have just got this amazing bond and that we're growing together and we're seeing so much of the kingdom together. Um, so, yeah, I'm so excited for next week, and I'm excited for tonight. And Pastor Rod and Pastor Julie, they send their love, and the whole of CCF sends their love as well. Um, Diana is actually um, sorted it so that I can show a prom promo video. So this is a, bo a book trailer for the book that Pastor Steve was just talking about. So I've just asked the guys to show it um, because I just want to briefly just say something about the sessions that are going to be um, led by me tomorrow and on Saturday. I think sexuality is a gift to be enjoyed and celebrated, to be honoured and cherished. But I think the way that we perceive sexuality and love, intimacy, desire, I think it's been deeply fractured because we live in a world that's broken. So instead of sexuality being something that you enjoy and thrive in, it can often be painful and confusing, filled with guilt and shame. But I am so sure that there is a way to truly thrive in your sexuality. And I want that for this generation. I want us to enjoy the highest kind of intimacy. I want to see a generation reject counterfeit intimacy and rewire their desire towards true intimacy. I believe it's available for everyone and I believe it's what we were created for. We were created for love. So, um, you may watch that and think, actually, the message of sacred sexuality hasn't really got anything to do with me. I'm not having sex or, you know, whatever your reasons might be. But I truly believe that this message is for all of us. And the reason that I believe it is because we are made in the image of God as male and female. And we've been created for intimacy. Every single human being has been created for the deepest, sweetest kind of intimacy that anyone could even imagine in their wildest dreams. And to not engage in that is daylight robbery. And so this message is for every single person who's ever been created by God. And if we as Christians don't understand that message, then how are we ever going to see a generation liberated? And we have an entire generation that's sexually broken, an entire generation that's looking for love in all the wrong places. And many people in the church 
are doing exactly the same thing. And the church does need to be set free, but the church needs to enjoy the beauty of sexuality the way that God has ordained. And we are all sexual beings. And so I would encourage you, please come. Please come and hear this message. You could be a liberator in this, like in your workplaces, in your family, in your communities. You might be the only person who understands true identity when it comes to sexuality. And the people around you, the spheres of influence around you, they need this message. So I ask you again, please come. If you can't come tomorrow night, come on the Saturday. And if you can't make it, but you know someone who can, send them. Awesome. Great. Um, Pastor Steve, thank you so much for asking me to um, speak. I'm going to pray. Jesus, thank you so much. Lord, I absolutely cannot do this in my own strength. It's probably about 4.30 a.m. right now. (laughs) But I know with you, I can do absolutely everything. And so I just give you this message. And I ask you to take hold of every single heart, including my own, and just arrest us. Arrest us. Engage us with what you're doing right now, that we would be able to sense the announcement of your glory, that we would be able to sense what you're saying, what you're showing us. Jesus, thank you that you are found in the broken places. I just ask that you would take over. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So tonight I would love to talk about the glory of God found in the messiest places the most awkward places, the uncomfortable places in our everyday life, the places that actually we want to run away from, the places that if our flesh masters us, then we end up ignoring those places in our communities, ignoring those broken places in our world, and we tend to run away to comfort. We tend to run away to convenience. But actually, There are facets of God's glory that are reserved for the broken places. There are realms of God's glory that I believe can only be found in darkness. And actually, when we run away from those places, we end up denying ourselves experiences of God's glory. For me, this has been something that God has been speaking to me about so much since June. I had this encounter in June. That just blew my mind. I met these two men called Steve and Andy. And I had never met these men before. And someone set up a meeting between myself and them. I run a business called Living in Light, Sacred Sexuality. My book, all of that falls under the umbrella of Living in Light. And God had spoken to me this year about expanding Living in Light and really just going for it with my business. And so a friend of mine had set up a meeting between me and these two men who so into people, who so into people's dreams. And it was completely a divine encounter. And she knew that I was at the verge of expanding my company and that I needed financial support. And so I went to this meeting and I already knew it was a divine encounter and I wasn't wasn't fussed what happened. Like I already knew that God was going to show up at this encounter. And so when I met these two men, they asked me all this stuff about my business. They asked me all this stuff about my story, my testimony. And they asked me what living in light was about. They asked me what I do. And I explained to them that, you know, I've got a fashion label and then lots of other strands. But with my fashion label, I make bespoke pieces. So I make um, made-to-measure pieces for each individual. And that for me, I was explaining that it's really it's, it's too expensive because you have to spend like all day making clothes for this one client, but that, that brings me joy because this one client might be someone who can't find clothes anywhere else, might be someone who's quite overweight, but here they are, someone's going to, you know, a designer's going to create a bespoke item just for them. And 
when I was speaking to them and I was explaining about my business, they just looked at me and they said, that's where the glory is in your business. It's there. That's where God is. Like where God is just honing in on that one person and saying that you are worth my time. And for me, as someone in business, when I'm thinking of expanding, I'm thinking, oh, maybe I'll stop making bespoke pieces. Maybe I'll start doing standard sizes because it's more cost effective. But what these men were showing me, they were saying, no, 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 don't. The beauty is in you honing in on the one because that's exactly what Jesus does. And then they continued to challenge me. Then they were like, oh, um, have you got any ethical aspect of your brand? So then I explained to them that, yeah, sure. Um, through my book, I give money to an anti-trafficking organization. I was explaining, and then I was saying, in the near future, I would love to start giving money um, or somehow sewing into women that have come out of trafficking so that they can make my clothes. And I was saying, I know it sounds a bit cliched, but kind of that's like, I think that's what I'm going to do to sew back into the community. And then all of a sudden, they said, um, have you ever thought about refugees? And then I was like, mm, I guess not. And then they began just to say, like, imagine if you started sewing into the refugees in your neighborhood. And the craziest thing is, is that I've been praying for refugees for the last two years. Like, when I think of refugees and I think of the amount of refugees that are coming into my country and I think of their plight and I think of just how they've been displaced and they come to our nation and they once used to be somebody in their own country and then they come to England and they're nobody. They've got no money. Many of them have obviously lost family members, many of them have lost jobs, lost the clothes on their back, like they have absolutely nothing, like I had been praying for them, but I had never made the connection that somehow my life, my everyday life could somehow be a light to people that are in the refugee community. In the end, these two men ended up giving me £10,000 in that meeting. Like, they literally said, we're going to bless you with £10,000, and you can do whatever you want with it. They said, we just, we see beauty in what you're carrying. We see beauty in your brokenness, is what they said to me. And we're going to give you this money, and you can do whatever you like with it. And as much as I appreciate the money, like, I'm blown away by this money, and this is what's going to pay for these refugees, that I'm going to now start hiring. But more than anything, what I love about what these two men did is they changed the way that I think. Up until that point, I would have said that I'm quite unconventional. I would have said that, yeah, you know, I do outreach and, you know, I kind of do things. Like I'm, I don't do things in a box. Like, as a believer, I'm kind of a little bit out there. But actually, when I sat there and met these two men, I mean, they had experienced God's glory in broken places that I had no real understanding of. Like, they understood how to discern God's beauty in broken places. Like, they understood, they could hear, they could discern the announcement of God's glory in places that otherwise would seem dark or otherwise would seem ordinary but they were able to hone in and extract those places of beauty and magnify them. And I loved that. And it began to challenge me. It began to really make me think that what would it look like if I actually could discern the announcement of God's glory in my ordinary life, amongst the homeless, on the commute when I'm going to work or when I'm, you know, walking past a, a place that actually I would much rather avoid or the ugly places of life, the places, you know, I, I, I do some work in a school and there's kids that are, are, are battling with transgender issues. I have people that are divorcing in front of me. I have people that are wrestling with abortion. Imagine if I could actually discern God's glory in those broken places, in those places where actually my flesh often resists. My flesh often actually just wants an easy life. My flesh just wants comfort. 
But imagine if there was a hunger and a thirst within me to go into those awkward places of society, those awkward, uncomfortable, inconvenient places of society where there is such a stench of brokenness. Imagine if I was willing to seek after the fragrance of God's glory in those dark, dark, often smelly, messy places. Imagine if I actually partnered with Jesus when in John 1, 14, where it says the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood, we saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, generous, inside and out, true from start to finish. Imagine if I actually partnered with Jesus in my neighborhood because he's there. He's in our neighborhoods. He's in our neighborhoods. We're not waiting for him to turn up. He's already there. His glory is already there, but it needs to be unveiled. And he uses us to unveil it. He uses us to seek after his glory. He uses us to be able to pursue what he's already doing and actually where we want to have an encounter with him in those dark places. In our flesh, we run away. In our natural senses, we see homeless people or we see conflict or we see refugees or we see all these messes of society. And in our natural senses, we're fearful. In our natural senses, we smell the stench. In our natural senses, we see disease or we see homelessness or we see poverty. But imagine if we actually looked at the messy places in society with our spiritual eyes with our spiritual senses. Imagine if we could smell the fragrance of God's glory just being released. Imagine if we could see wholeness. Imagine if we could see breakthrough. And actually our spiritual senses are what drove us on our everyday life, and our everyday commute, in our everyday engagement with broken society. Imagine if we were being led by our spiritual senses rather than our natural senses. Because our natural capacity is to shut down. It is to run away. And I don't know about you guys, but I know that as out there as I can sometimes think I am, or as much outreach as I can do, I often run away. I often pretend I haven't seen it. I often just say, sorry, mate, I haven't got any money today. Or I haven't got time, or I can't stop. That is actually my natural posture. But the more I hang around with Jesus and the more I get a glimpse of his beauty, the more I am beginning to hunger and thirst to go to those dirty places of society, to go to those awkward places, to those messy places, because I know I'm going to meet Jesus there. And it's not just going to be from a place of compassion, but actually to see his beauty When they said to me, um, have you thought of refugees? As I said, I'd been praying for refugees for the last couple of years, but I didn't know that I could somehow use my business to be able to bring beauty into their lives. Because what they said is they said, imagine. Imagine if you found people, Bobby, who used to be designers in you know, um, the Middle East. And when they came to this country, imagine if your business could beautify them once again and restore their dignity, like give them life again. Imagine if you could be used to restore their dreams. And then I thought, why, why haven't I thought of refugees? Why haven't I considered them? If I've been praying for them, why haven't I considered them? And the truth is, is that to a certain degree, I will pray for Muslims, but I'm not going to hire one, right? That's what's going on inside of my heart. I'll pray on minister to unbelievers, but mm -mm, we're not working together. Why did I leave my secular job if I'm just going to go and hire an unbeliever? And these things were coming up. I was realizing that in my consecrated life, in my pursuit of consecration, you know, because I've come out of the world now and now I need to be holy. And I did to a certain degree, you know, like I don't want to be in a worldly atmosphere. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And as they challenged me, I understood that, oh my gosh, I've settled for conventional Christianity. I do, yeah, sure, you know, I'll I'll, I'll sow into anti-trafficking. Loads of Christians are doing that. 
But what's God saying to me? What is God saying I should do? Where is the beauty that he has already outlined? He's already moved into my neighborhood. Where is the beauty? Where are glimpses of his glory that he has reserved for me to see and me to unveil by partnering him? Because I won't just settle for conventional Christianity. I won't just do what everyone else is doing. I will do what he is showing me to do. And the craziest thing is, is that there I was wrestling with, this conviction that, oh my gosh, I am a conventional Christian. I do settle for just ordinary. And then I was like thinking that, yes, I never hired refugees because I didn't want to be around unbelievers on a daily basis, or maybe some of them would be Muslims. And the wildest thing is that the first refugee that I then began working with, she came to my house. She was from China. And she was a believer. That's what smashed it. She ended up being a believer. And she sat in my living room, in my studio, and she did half a day's work with me, and then we broke for lunch. And then I said, do you want to pray? And then she said, yes. And then she closed her eyes, and I closed my eyes, and then she began to pray in Mandarin. And it was the most beautiful experience. And I sat there like, wowed in awe of this beautiful God who orchestrates beauty in this way. And over the four days that she worked with me, I mean, I don't even know her history. Both her parents had died when she was a child. I don't know how old she was, like maybe in her 20s. And there was so much brokenness in her. She was very quiet at the beginning of the four days. And by the end of the four days, she was so bubbly And as she was leaving, I ended up praying with her. And she wept and she wept and she wept. And it was the most beautiful encounter. And I would have missed out on it. If I'd settled for conventional Christianity, I would have missed out on this opportunity to see the beauty of Jesus that is hidden in these unconventional places. Because that's what my flesh tends to do. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus, what we read about the Gospels, what we read about how he had this incredible way to be able to meet with people that were in dire circumstances. He didn't run in the opposite direction. He met them exactly where they were. And he was led by his spiritual senses. He could see glory. He could hear glory. He could smell glory. He knew it. He knew how to discern the glory of God. I'd love for us to turn to John. Well, actually, only if you've got the Passion Translation, because I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. So if you've got the Passion Translation, please turn to John, um, chapter 5, and I'm going to read from up there. Then Jesus returned to Jerusalem to observe one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the sheep gate, there is a pool called in Aramaic, the house of loving kindness. And this pool is surrounded by five colored porches. Hundreds of sick people were lying there on the porches, the paralyzed, the blind and the crippled, all of them waiting for their healing. For for an angel of God would periodically descend into the pool to stir up the waters and the first one who stepped into the pool after the water swelled would instantly be healed. Now, there was a man who had been disabled for 38 years, lying among the multitude of the sick. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that the man had been crippled for a long time. So Jesus said to him, do you truly long to be healed? I'm going to skip to verse 15. Then the man went to the Jewish leaders to inform them. Guys, sorry, I'm going to read from here, if that's all right, because... um, Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to five. Now, there was a man who had been disabled for 38 years, lying among the multitude of the sick. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that the man had been crippled for a long time. So Jesus said to him, do you truly long to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, there's no way I can get healed, for I have no one who will lower me into the water when the angel comes. As soon as I try to crawl to the edge of the pool, someone else jumps in ahead of me. 
Then Jesus said to him, stand up, pick up your sleeping mat and you will walk. Immediately he stood up. He was healed. So he rolled up his mat and walked again. Now this miracle took place on the Jewish Sabbath. 15. Then the man went to the Jewish leaders to inform them. It was Jesus who healed me. So from that day forward, the Jewish leaders began to persecute Jesus because of the things he did on the Sabbath. Jesus answered his critics by saying, every day my father is at work and I will be too. This infuriated them and made them all the more eager to devise a plan to kill him. For not only did he break their Sabbath rules, but he called God my father, which made him equal to God. So Jesus said, I speak to you timeless truth. The son is not able to do anything from himself or through my own initiative. I only do the works that I see the father doing. For the son does the same works as his father. Jesus is so cool. It's unbelievable. So this sheep gate that we read about uh, in verse 1 is where the sacrificial animals were brought into the temple. So pretty much anyone during a feast who needed to present a sacrifice would have to go around there. I would avoid it, probably. Like, in my natural kind of condition, I would probably avoid it. And sometimes I would go there. But imagine that place. Like, imagine what it would be like. Imagine if that's where people are congregating to be healed. Imagine the sense of desperation that would be around that place. And this pool of Bethesda, it, as I explained, it says the house of loving kindness or otherwise translated the house of mercy. So for people, it was a place of mercy. Imagine being paralyzed. Imagine being crippled. Imagine being desperate. And then there's this There's this belief that actually the angel will come down and stir up the water and then whoever goes in first will get healed. Imagine how people would congregate around that area in this desperate desire that they would be healed. Imagine just how crazy that area would be. Imagine the sickness. Imagine the disease. Imagine the pain. Imagine the heartache. Who would go there? Like, if you're not sick, who would really go there? Most people, most of us in our humanity, we would bypass that place. We would. It kind of reminds me of a train in London. There's an overground train. It's the Orange Line. And because it's one whole carriage, you have a lot of homeless people a lot of um just beggars that get on that train and because it's the outskirts of london it's like you can kind of um get away with not using a ticket an oyster card to get through so you have a lot of beggars and a lot of homeless people who will get on that train without needing a ticket and then they just walk up and down the carriage and then they beg for money and that train is their bethesda That train is their house of mercy. They're hoping that somehow someone would stir up the water, that someone would be so moved with compassion that someone would heal them. They're so desperate. Like I saw someone yesterday on that train and their hands are so dirty and their footwear is battered and... When you're a commuter on that train, some days you'll give money, some days you'll speak to them, and some days you'll just look at your phone. Some days you'll just... You'll just pray quietly and just be like, Lord, I'm so sorry I'm not doing anything for that person right now. And the the wrestle is daily. The wrestle is daily when you see broken people and you see people that need your help And they are looking for a place of mercy. And they are looking for someone to stir up the waters. Someone to be moved to compassion by their plight, by their need. And oftentimes in my flesh, I just want to walk away. I love how Jesus, he didn't walk away. I love how he went there. He went there intentionally. He actually went there with every intention of 
unveiling God's glory with every intention of going on an adventure. Because the thing is, I mean, please don't get me wrong. Like, I, 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 I kind of see a lot. You know, I do outreach and I, I purposely go to places so that I can be compassion, so I can be led by God. But I just didn't realize what an adventure it was until this year. I didn't realize until I met those two men the beauty of extracting God's glory out of a situation and magnifying it where everything else, the darkness just pales. The darkness just fades away. And it becomes an adventure that you can go on with Jesus. It becomes a place of wonder and a place of awe, a place of beauty where actually all you see is his beauty. And then you begin to go after those places. You begin to think, oh my gosh, actually I want more of that. I want to see more of God in the dark places because like I said earlier, there is a realm of God's glory that is just reserved for darkness. There are aspects of his nature and his mercy and his kindness and his beauty that none of us will ever see in the light. They shine bright in the darkness. And so Jesus goes looking for these places and he comes and he sees this man and he approaches him in the middle of his pain. And like the scriptures say, he's fully aware. He knows that the man's been sick for 38 years. He knows he's an invalid. He knows he's got problems. He knows that. He knows that this is this man's truth. And sometimes I've heard people talk about this scripture and say that this man had self-pity. But I don't, I don't know if it's self-pity. That was his truth. I mean, genuinely, if you've been an invalid for 38 years, you are relying on someone else to put you in the water. You can't get there yourself. That is your truth. It is your truth that you can't move. That is legitimately your story. But I love how Jesus went there because Jesus knew a truer truth. Jesus knew a truer truth. And he, he didn't deny that man's situation, but he, over, he just overrided it. He just said, I'm not denying what you're going through, but actually... I know a truer truth. And sometimes we don't go to these situations because we haven't grasped the truer truth. Sometimes with our natural senses, all we see is their pain. All we see is their limitation. All we see is the divorce. All we see is the transgender issues and the identity issues. All we see is brokenness. All we see is someone limping. But actually, the finished work is wholeness. And we need to continuously get a revelation for that and get a revelation of wholeness and a revelation of original intention of the Father for that person, for that situation. And we need to allow that to so overwhelm our senses so that when we encounter these broken places, we're encountering them not in our natural senses but in our spiritual senses that we can see wholeness. And this is what Jesus saw. When Jesus said to him, do you truly long to be healed? It wasn't like he was asking a trick question. Because Jesus knew that this man's problem wasn't a physical healing. Jesus knew that what Jesus saw in the realm of the spirit was wholeness. He didn't just see this man being physically healed. He saw this man become whole. And the word that is used here for do you want to be healed, I could pronounce it wrong, but it's genesthe. And actually, it means wholeness. And it's not wholeness from do you want to be healed, future tense. It's wholeness that's already been achieved. So what Jesus was saying do you want the wholeness that's already been achieved for you? Are you willing to sever ties with your truth to step into a truer truth? And this word, genesthe, it's, it means are you willing to be generated whole? And this is where genesis comes from. Are you willing to be made new? Are you willing to be a creation, a new creation? Are you willing to truly come into existence? 
And Jesus could see that. Jesus could see a new creation. Jesus could see original intention. Jesus could see what this man would look like whole. And sometimes we don't have a picture of wholeness. This is why we get intimidated. This is why we cower. This is why we shrink back because we think, what if God doesn't show up? What if his leg doesn't get healed? What if the divorce still goes ahead? What if she has that abortion? What if, you know, what if the homeless man doesn't end up getting a shelter for tonight? We have all these what ifs because we see the natural situation. But actually, what we need to see is wholeness. What we need to see is original intention. The original intention of the Father over every single broken circumstance in our fragile society in the finished work. What the finished work has already achieved. But the only way we can do that is when we look at the face of Jesus. It's when we look at his face. As we just enjoy him, just like Pastor Steve has been teaching for the last 18 months, when we enjoy Jesus and we behold him and we fall in love with him more and more and more and our natural senses get overwhelmed by what we're seeing in the spiritual senses. When it comes to neurology, because I had to learn about this stuff for the sacred sexuality stuff, And if there are any scientists uh, in the room, please forgive my very basic explanation. But when um, when we respond to something, we respond with our natural senses. So we smell something, we taste something, we hear something, et cetera. And whenever we respond to our senses... Depending on our response, neurolog- neurological pathways are formed. And those thoughts, those f- um, neurological pathways become our thought pattern. And each time we keep repeating that, those mental pathways become stronger. And a, and a belief system is slowly established. But when we actually use our senses in an experience... What ends up happening is the chemical reactions in an experience fire and wire together. So they wire and fire together. And then the response of that is much stronger on our senses. So when we have a supernatural encounter with God and we have these experiences that consume us, the capacity for our neurology to fire and wire together and change the way that we think is so magnified compared to if we just sense something with our natural senses. If we just read the word with our natural sight, if we just hear the word with our natural ears, if we keep doing it, then habit does get formed. But when we have an experience with God... There is something that sparks us, cements within our mind. And that's the way that we begin to think. And the more experiences we have in the sanctuary, the more encounters we have with the glory of God in the sanctuary, the more equipped we will be to move in the sewers. Because when we're in the sewers, when we're in the darkness, when we're in those complex situations... Our natural senses will not master us anymore because what happens in the sanctuary will cement the finished work in the way that we think. And what we encounter in the secret place with God will so become our wiring that when we encounter those broken places, when we encounter those places where our natural resistance in our flesh is to be fearful, is to be anxious, is to run away, But the more we spend time in the sanctuary, the more we behold the face of Jesus, the more we fall in love with him, the more that overtakes the way that we think and our natural senses no longer drive us. And if we can be a people that are willing to go to the highways and the byways in our spheres of influence, I mean, maybe none of us here are going to go to Iraq. Maybe none of us here are going to be used by God to smuggle Bibles. None of that, you know, amazing, wild, unconventional stuff. But there's so many unconventional places that God has laid out for us in our own spheres of influence. 
those places that we usually run away from. But I believe that if we are able to continuously behold the glory of God, to keep looking at Jesus, then we will recognize that it's not us, it's all him. It's all him. He transforms us by his spirit. He equips us and he sends us out. And then when we go and we have these encounters and we're seeing what he's seeing, the same way he speaks in these scriptures and he says that he only does what he sees his father doing. Imagine if we went out into our spheres of influence, into those broken places of society, into the, ter- into the turmoil, into the conflict, and we did what the father showed us. But the amazing thing is that doesn't mean you have to heal everybody. That doesn't mean you have to deliver everybody. Jesus didn't do that. You know, it says in the scripture that he went to that one man. If he wanted to, in a split second, he could have healed everybody. But he went to that one man. And so the pressure, like I know sometimes I feel this pressure at certain times. Every single time I see a homeless person, Every time I see a homeless person, I'm convicted or I'm like, oh, I should have given them money or I should have done that or I should have stopped. But actually, this summer has just been amazing because I've been, I believe, stepping out a little bit into what the Father is showing me. And I remember this one particular weekend last month where every single time I passed a homeless person, I just feel like, oh, Lord, I didn't give them any money. And I was like, oh, but Lord, I don't think they were really homeless. I mean, they had a phone. So, you know, maybe they don't deserve my money. And then in other situations, I'd be like, oh, Lord, but I just, but I need that money. You know, like I'd have these ongoing conversations and there'd just be this pressure like, Bobby, you're not really a Christian if you're not blessing these people. Um, And then I literally just walked past this one woman and instantly, before I even had time to think about anything, I had gone to her. And I knew that in that moment, I'd heard the announcement of God's glory. It wasn't me. It wasn't like striving. It wasn't trying to do the Christian thing. I had sensed the announcement of God's glory. And then the following day, I remember, like, um, again, I walked past. I was just finished church, and it was roasting hot. It was like the hottest day of um, this year. Boiling hot. And I finished church. I was just walking down the road about to go to... Uh, do a bit of shopping and I saw homeless people again so the same conversation like Lord you know I mean do I all of that and then um, I carried on walking and then all of a sudden I just saw this man and before I even thought of what I was doing I just turned around to see him and I said oh mate he, he stunk a bit and I was like oh mate like can I get you a sandwich and he's like oh no 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 thanks and then I was like oh okay cool and then he said um why did you offer me a sandwich? Do I look like I'm hungry? And then I was like, uh, uh, I didn't know what to say. And then he was like, oh, I look a bit, I look a bit thin, don't I? And I was like, yes, you do. And then um, he said, I look a bit scruffy, right? And then I said, yes. He said, but I'm not homeless. And then he explained to me that, um, he said, no, what I do, yeah, is like I try and tone it down a bit because I don't want the attention. <laughs> And this is crazy. We're having this conversation now. So then I'm like, oh, right, right, right. He's like, oh, you, you must know what I mean. Like, you know, we, we don't want the attention, right? Like, we just, we just carry on. We just do what we're doing. And, you know, we just don't want people giving us attention. And then I was like, okay. And then we ended up just having this conversation. And it was the most incredible conversation. He was homeless, even though he wouldn't admit it, because he was so full of positivity. And he ended up knowing the Lord, like he knew the Lord. He shared all these scriptures with me and it was the most amazing experience. Like his faith, his hunger for God, despite him being homeless, despite him having nothing, no money, he just has no family, he has nothing, yet he had faith in God. And we stood at the traffic lights, boiling hot. He stunk, like he actually stunk. But... I am not kidding you. As I stood there, I could just smell the fragrance of Christ. All I could smell was the fragrance of Christ. And this man began to just minister to me. 
He began to tell me how, you know, he has so much faith in God and he knows God's going to do it for him and that he's a musician and he just loves music that edifies God. And I am standing there just thinking, oh my gosh, like I would have missed out on this. I would have missed out on this. And there are so many encounters that God has lined up for us. If God wanted to, God could deal with every issue in a split second. When I think of the poverty and I think of all the heartache and I think of all the brokenness, everything that's malfunctioning in this world, if Jesus wanted to, he could annihilate sickness. He already has, but he could do it now so that our lives had no sickness in them in the present time. But he allows brokenness. Because in brokenness, we look for his glory. In brokenness, we see his compassion. We see his mercy. We see sides of Jesus that we'd never see on the mountaintops. Like this outreach that I do um, in some nightclubs. Sometimes, so what we do in these nightclubs, we go to these nightclubs and all these clubbers, like they're off their trolley, they're drinking, they're smoking, they're doing, you know, all this wild stuff. Some of them are making out with each other. Like, it's obviously such a worldly environment. And then we're called the club angels. And we um, help look for people that they might have lost. If they're, if they're lost, we help track them down, uh, track down their friends. And um, if they're vomiting, we clean their vomit. If they're, you know, if they've been badly treated, like, we will help them. We will get their home, all of that stuff, get them home. There are some nights where I pray, Jesus, just close this club down. Like, just close the club down. Like, uh, I mean, come on. Like, you know, Lord, just close this club down. Like, blah, blah, blah. But actually, he doesn't. Because he shows up week after week as he cleans their vomit, as he wipes their brow, as they're half-dressed and they're so drunk they don't even know what their name is. And Jesus is right there helping them, beautifying them, giving them dignity. If Jesus closed down the club, we'd never see this side of him. He allows brokenness so that we can see his glory and his majesty and aspects of his character and we can know his nature in such a beautiful way. I remember um, once being in my kitchen and just praying for the persecuted church and I was reading like a booklet. You know how you get booklets from like open doors and stuff and they give you prayer points for each day? And um, I remember just reading the prayer point. It was stuck on my notice board. And as I was praying, I was reading it, reading it. And I read about this woman who, who was asking for prayer for her daughter because basically her daughter had gone to this home, a Muslim family, one day to do some work and then she'd never come back. And she disappeared, and the family were trying to track down what had happened to her. And so the father, the next day, went to the family home to find out what had happened to his, uh, who, to his daughter. And they had killed her. They'd killed the daughter. And I remember, like, no, they'd killed the dad. They killed the dad. And, um, and as I was reading this, I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach because I'm there praying and I'm like praying over these points. And then when, when I read that the dad had been killed or been murdered, instantly I remember thinking to myself, like, Jesus, how could you let that happen? And then as I continued reading her prayer points, the mother was praying for the daughter's salvation and praying that despite the frailties of the situation despite the dad dying that the daughter wouldn't lose her faith and as I began to just think that imagine you're you're as a wife you've left you've lost your husband your husband's been murdered you don't know where your daughter is she's disappeared and all you're praying for is that she would hold on to her salvation and as I began to pray and pray and pray like I was weeping and weeping and weeping and then all I could sense was God's sovereignty. All I could sense was that God is seated on the throne. 
Jesus is seated on the throne. Yet he's there with that mother and he's there with the daughter if she's still alive. And he's weeping. I could feel Jesus weeping, but he was on the throne. He was sovereign, but he was weeping. And I never would have experienced that side of God's nature if I hadn't even read about this brokenness of the persecuted church. And he constantly allows us to be exposed to brokenness because inside of there is his glory. And if we flee brokenness and we we carry on just with our happy, safe, conventional Christian lives, there are sides of Jesus' nature that we will never, ever experience. There is beauty that will pass us by if we don't go into those dark places. And I don't know if everyone wants this. I know I want it, like I really, really do. But not everyone wants it. So you're going to have to ask yourself if you want it. Because it is uncomfortable and it is awkward and it is unconventional to actually look for God's glory in the dark places. And I know many of you sitting here do that as part of your ministry. Like I'm still in my infancy. So if you would like to experience God's glory in a greater measure, and if you would want to be someone who is able to discern the announcement of God's glory in your spheres of influence, whether it's your commute to college, whether it's your family environment where there might be divorce, there might be brokenness, there might be a child who's rebelling, whether it's you wanting to reach out to the homeless, whether it's you wanting to... Go into the messiest, dirtiest, stinkiest places that you are aware of. And if you want the courage and the pursuit to do that, and above all, if your hunger is to meet Jesus there, then I'm going to ask you to stand. And don't be forced into it. Because it's not something that we can do in our own strength. And it has to be something that Jesus continuously transforms us in through his Holy Spirit. And as I pray, I'm praying this for myself as well as all of us. And I'm going to ask that even before we pray, I'm going to ask us to pray in the Spirit. And as we begin to pray in the Spirit, I'm going to ask you to begin to picture those unconventional places, those streets, those encounters, those scenarios, those families, those people groups. Begin to picture them. And we're just going to pray in tongues over those places that are uncomfortable for you and awkward for you, but that God wants to unveil his beauty to you and through you in those places. Just begin to picture them now. Mogura la cata da cata rica de demo, Kira la cara la caccia, si chiede de mogura la cata da cata rica de demo, cuzza la cata zarata, scende de chiede de mogura la cata zarata, scende de chiede de mogura la cara la cara le chiede de mogura, si chiede de mogura la cata zarata, scende de chiede de mogura, scende de chiede de mogura, Jesus, 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 thank you because you came and you moved into the neighbourhood. The word became flesh and moved into the neighbourhood. 
And you are very much in our neighborhoods. And you are in this city. And you are in our families. And you are in our spheres of influence. And you are in our jobs. And you are on the commute to work. And you are in the brokenness, in the fragility of humanity. You are there. And we want to meet you. We want to meet you and we want to see you with a greater yearning and a greater hunger and a greater pursuit. And we want to partner with you. And we want to have spiritual senses that are led by you. We want to have senses that truly hear the sound of glory, that can see what you're doing, that can smell the fragrance of your beauty in the most unbeautiful places. We want to touch you with our spiritual senses in those places that seem the most awkward. And we cannot do it in our own strength. In our own strength, we are prone to settle for the comfort zone. In our own strength, we are prone to tire. We are prone to get bored. We are prone to just settle for the easy option and let someone else come and stir up the waters. But tonight, we're lifting up our arms and we're saying, open our eyes and open our ears and give us eyes to see what the Father is doing in our own worlds so that we may be conduits for your glory to be seen, that we may be wowed and in awe of all that you are, even in the dark places. Would you have your way, Jesus? through each and every one of us. Jesus, I just pray right now, would you begin to bring to each person's heart, the eyes of their heart, their ears, would you bring just visions and sounds of what you're doing in their worlds, of people that you've already lined up for them to touch, them to speak to, them to minister to them just to befriend Father would you begin to show those places where you are already there waiting for them to simply meet you Jesus you are beautiful let your light shine in darkness through our lives Lord we give our hearts to you right now we say that you have got permission to dazzle us in the broken places of our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a, a great backdrop for coming into the Glory Conference in a week to see God's not afraid to go anywhere and He wants to access everywhere. And you know, it says that as the waters cover the sea, the glory of God will cover the earth. And the funny thing about the sea is it goes, waters always go to the low place. So, yes, thank you, Bobby. Powerful, powerful. I want us to, um, if you'll all stand, I want to release a blessing. I want us to bless and thank God for Bobby we'll put a couple of the buckets on either side of the stage if you, anybody would like to sow into her life and she's come by faith and we want to send her out you can just write a check to Jubilee Church and we'll be able to bless her but right now let's let's ask the Lord because I know that we've all been in that you know I remember you, you get on the freeway especially in the 70s everybody was hitchhiking so I'd be picking up hitchhikers all the time and then afterwards I couldn't pass a hitchhiker without having to pick up one so then I was always praying God please don't let there be a hitchhiker because it all turned into works and have to so you can never go there so you did a really good job of letting us know the have to will never go away and you just gotta not you gotta not meet God there because then it's just something that will you you will run out of the ability but if you can stay up in the freedom then there's those moments that aren't the everybody's it's the one God chose for you for that moment so thank you so Lord we would um, bless Bobby we thank you for bringing her here and well the brilliance of the way she shared and freedom and we thank you for the ministry yet in the next couple of days and even in the workshop she'll get to do during our conference and we ask you to continue just to open doors of of, of possibilities and and 
opportunity and and encounters that are that are both uh, where your glory comes and begins to abide and begins to be found and begins to bring life and light and lord do it in all of our lives in that freedom where we we can walk with you in sonship and only do what we hear and see our father saying and doing and not under pressure and of got to stay away or we got to get involved but more we can be led as you lead so lord bless bobby we ask you to this offering be a blessing and we ask that in the next week even as we are preparing our hearts to to come under this glorious banner of the glorious gospel of the glory of christ that you would um do it in a way where we then are liberated and we are not free, afraid but we're free and we can move with that sense of of confidence that you carry when you walk the earth and you would carry us in in the, our journey and we bless this season and this pointed time that we're here and we ask if we can begin tomorrow with more smiles if you give us just simple things just opportunities to let kindness break forth in our midst even as deborah shared last week that we would just think well of one another don't lord so we wouldn't try to be heroic to do something valuable we just allow the begin where we are and begin to give freely from within a heart of compassion and desire and pleasure to see you have access and joy and get see what you see so help us see what you see so we can do what you do in jesus name we pray amen